wasn't what I expected. Well, eventually we made our way to the beach and then we made our way down to Palmerston North was the town that we felt God wanted us in. And eventually we found a church that we felt we could be a part of and I learned something about prophecy in that church that was revolutionary to me. The pastor, uh, one day, he, he said he, this, this gentleman was coming in to speak, and he said, uh, this person we consider a prophet. We consider him a prophet because last time he was here, he said this, and this is what we did. I mean, he talked... If I remember right, he talked about one big pool becoming many, many streams. And so this church actually went from, they sold their church building and went to four different, three different locations around town because of what this prophet said. So he was coming in again and, and uh, he basically spoke and then shared what he was praying about for this church. And they were broad strokes, he was saying, like something about healing was the one I remember. There's about five things that he said. Uh, the Monday night, the pastor called a prayer meeting, and almost all the church was there. And we broke up into small groups, and each group had a scribe, someone to write down what we were praying. And the pastors would just say, okay, he said, like, for example, he said something, he said we're going to be a place of healing. What does that mean? Pray that through. So all of us would pray, what would it mean for us to be a place of healing? And the scribe was writing the things down. And then we went through the five different things, and then we, we shared with the whole group what we said about, each, what we prayed about each thing. And it was incredibly encouraging, because everything everybody prayed about was the same things. You know, a place of healing. It was about physical healing. It was about emotional healing. It was about relational healing. It was about training people to go out in the streets and heal. And everybody prayed the same way. Then the pastor said, okay, now we're, we're going to, you give this to us. You entrust this to us, and we're going to see how we can work it out in the life of our church. You see, what I realized in that process was I was treating prophecies with contempt. I was hearing God speak Sunday morning, and if it was a warm, fuzzy thing that made me feel good, great. If not, I would just ignore it. And what does Paul say? He says, do not treat prophecies with contempt. I was doing that. The second thing that happened when we were down there was um, one of my mentors at the time was Wynne Lewis, and Wynne was the head of the Elam churches in England. I met him, uh, I had him come speak at a conference I was doing here in Edmonton, and we hit it off, and I was in contact with him after that for years. And... Uh, he knew about our trip to New Zealand and he was praying for us and encouraging us and he, he called or emailed me up and he said that uh, a friend of his, Rodney Francis, was going to be in Palmerston North doing a conference on prophecy. So uh, he's, you know, he thought it'd be good if we could go and it'd be a great, sure, we'll go. But our kids were little and we didn't really know anyone in the town that we could impose babysitting on. So I stayed home with the kids and Karen went for the whole day. Uh, Rodney invited me and the kids to come for one part of the day. And so we came after the teaching had been taken place and came for the, for the activation time. And uh, what they did was they put four chairs in the front of the room and uh, Karen and I and the kids in between us were sitting there and Rodney said to this group that he was training on how to prophesy he said uh, these are Trevor and Karen from Canada that's all I'm telling you about them tell them what God thinks about them and for probably two and a half or three hours we had person after person after person come up and share a Bible verse share share a vision share something that they saw God saying and I got to tell you, it was a three and a half hour snot rag session for us. 
you know, like we were crying, bawling, laughing. It was, it was good. Pro- prophecy is powerful. After that time, there was a break, and I went uh, to the back of the room, and a, and a lady and her husband came and approached me. And they said, she said, I, I saw this vision, but it didn't make any sense to me, and I didn't know what, to, what it means but, and I'm like, well, tell me what it is, because, you know, we had two and a half hours of really good stuff, right? She said, I saw a bunch of cars on the corner of Rangatiki and Tremaine. That's two, two streets in Palmerston North. And, and I saw two cars, or a bunch of cars on Rangatiki and Tremaine, and I don't know what that means. And I, I told her, I said, that means I have to take the job if they offer it to me. You see, what she didn't know was about two weeks before there was a prayer meeting in town that the pastors called and we met in the convention center to pray against this sex expo that was coming to town just to tick off Christians. And they did things like uh, naked ladies were driving on the back of motorcycles around the town square and they just wanted to get the rise out of the Christians in the town. And so that night we went and we prayed over the place and we had a good prayer meeting. Like all the churches in town were there and all the pastors were there and and they were united and they were praying against this person trying to change the morals of town, of the town. Not, Not against the person, but against the spirit behind it. And it was a good prayer meeting. That was like on a Friday night. The sex expo happened the Saturday and the Sunday. And then the Monday, I got called in for this interview for the local paper, uh, the regional paper, uh, to do this job. uh, The the job they advertised was an uh, advertising features writer. And I'm in this interview with the editor and the person who'd be my boss. And... and, uh, Every time you've got pastor on your resume, you get the same questions. Like, you know, how, you as a pastor, how is this going to impact your work here with us? And I'm like, you know, should make it better, I would think. And he goes, well, what about the sex expo? When it comes back next year, you're going to have to write about it. And I'm like, oh, I could probably come up with a few stories about it because I'm thinking about the prayer meeting. And I could, there's lots of different stories I could write about the prayer meeting. And he said, no, you're going to have to promote it. And something in me, I I, I think the one time, maybe a couple of times, this was one time in my life where it was, I was righteously indignant. And I stuck my finger up in his face and I said, who are you to decide the morals of this town? Who do you think you are to side with somebody who is trying to tick off 85% of your readers? Who are you to say what mothers should talk about their daughters with and their sons with when naked women are going around here? You are not, you, I said, you are in a place of authority and it's for a purpose and you're going to be called to account if you use that authority wrongly. I think this interview is done, don't you? Good. And I left. And I was ticked off. <laughs> and, and I told Karen, I said, if he even wants me to work for him, I'm going to refuse. There's no way I'm going to do it. But then the next week, we were at this prophecy thing, and this lady saw this vision of cars on Rangatiki and Tremaine. See, I had no idea what an advertising feature was, so I looked in the paper, and that week there was an advertising feature on a new car dealership on Rangatiki and Tremaine. And so when she said that, I knew God wanted me to take that job. If they offered it to me, I didn't think they'd offer. So the next Monday, I got a call, and they offered me not that job, but a freelance job, which would allow me to refuse any job I didn't want to do. And they gave me a couple of articles the first week and the next week they gave me a whole insert on leisure which I needed to find 16 articles and all the advertising for this insert that they were doing and I didn't know anybody in the town like what am I I'm supposed to find people to interview but I knew that 85% of the people in the town went to church on a Sunday 
And if 85% went there and spent an hour or two, the biggest leisure activity in town was going to church. So one of the 16 stories I did was talking about church, and I interviewed the church pastors and, you know, wrote that up. And, and I got all 16 done, like the hour of the deadline. I was sitting in a coffee shop typing it up, and I think we actually had email then, so we, yeah, emailed it in. And um, the next week, they must have had good response from that article because the next week, um, the editor called me in again and he said, well, uh, you know the pastors in town, right? And I said, I know some of them, yeah. Um, I'd like to start running a column for their opinion pieces every week and I'd like everyone, you know, everyone to take a turn writing an article. Can you set that up? It's like, yeah, no problem. And it's because some lady didn't know what God had shown her, what it meant, but she risked sharing it with me. Because up until that point, I wasn't going to take that job, and I wasn't going to write that article, and I wasn't going to open up the door for, for this editor to see he actually has people that he can write to and for. Prophecy is powerful. Prophecy is powerful. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is the disclosing of the will and purpose of God through spirit-filled human beings. The Hebrew scriptures emphasize the importance of prophecy as a means of knowing God. The New Testament sets out a, the place of prophecy in the life of the church and gives guidance concerning the use of the gift. How can prophecy be delivered? Uh, it can be spoken. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, 6, 19, Paul tells us how we're to prophesy. It can be demonstrative actions. Uh, Acts 21, 10, and 11, again, Agabus with the belt. It's, it was a demonstrative action, prophetic act he did. Writing down, Revelation 11, 1, talks about writing down what you see. And... Uh, what we're learning in our, our home group is to write that down, and it can, it's an excellent tool for people. Prophetic songs and music can assist in the prophetic, and it can actually prophesy as well. Second uh, Kings 3.15, Elisha had a harpist. First Chronicles 25.3, writing three, down, Revelation 11.1, 11, prophesied with writing a harp. down. Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19 uh, talks about psalms and hymns and spiritual learning in our, our spiritual group is to write that down songs. and it can, it's they go out when we're people. gathered together and we're singing God's Prophetic praises. songs and music and a new can song assist in the prophetic. It, it can actually prophesy as well. Uh, 2 Kings 3.15. Reasons for Elisha prophecy. A it's a, the first Chronicles prophecy is number down, one. Revelation 11. The edification, exhortation, and comfort of other Christians. It is for building Songs and, and his words encouraging and his words telling them to write that what down. God they loves about them. them. Gathered together That's the number one reason God. for prophetic. prophetic. The number two reason that scripture tells us is um, that it's for the conviction of unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 and 25 says, but if all of you are prophesying and an unbeliever or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they'll be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall on their knees and worship God, declaring God is really in this place. Prophecy is that those words you speak that, that are just so good, they, they, they're not from you. <laughs> and by so good, it, it's timely, it's appropriate, it's done in love, it encourages, it builds up, it strengthens. How do we operate in the prophetic? If you're taking notes, this is where you're starting of the notes from now. Um, we're not all called to be prophets, but Paul was clear that he wished that we would all prophesy. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 5. First thing we do, we, we're, we need to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. That E is eagerly, if you're taking notes. 
We're told to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, 14, 1, 14, 12, 14, 39. Be eager for spiritual gifts. Since you are eager, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Uh, it, it, it's be eager. You have to be eager. This is just not for the prophetic. It's for all the gifts that we're going to talk about over the next several weeks. You want the gift. You need to want the gift. It's not a, okay, if God gives it to me, that'll be okay. It's a, God, I need this. I need to speak your words of life. You need to have that attitude. The Father responds to our desires. Uh, Psalm 34, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Uh, Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Whatever you desire, pray, the, pray uh, and believe that you've received them, and you shall have them. Like, you need... God responds to your desires, so we need to eagerly desire these spiritual gifts. Number two, we, we need to prophesy in faith. That's the, that's the F there, underlined faith. Luke 11, 5 to 13. I think we'll take time to read. <laughs> I'm looking at the confidence. We have a confidence timer up there. And I had to figure out if it was going up or going down. I just put it on for the first time today because I could really care less how long I go, but I just, for fun. And it, it doesn't, it's not giving me enough time. I'm just saying, it's already wrong. But okay, Luke 11. Uh, this is Jesus talking, starting at verse 5. Where am I in? Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine has come on a journey, has come and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is a friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. For he who seeks finds. To him who knocks the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for fish, will he give him a steak instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So many times when we talk about spiritual gifts, we have this attitude that it, God needs to possess me in order for me to use this gift. Uh, gift of tongues, we, we, the biggest hindrance to the gift of tongues, we think that God actually moves my lips and makes me speak. No, you have got to move your lips. You've got to form it. It, it comes from you. He doesn't possess. He, he, he moves a moving thing. Like he directs a moving thing. Um, and it's by faith. So when we have a hot seat here and you have an inkling of what something might be, but you don't know what it means or understand what it means, it's faith that gets you your butt off the seat to come up and share with what you see or what you hear or what, what is on your mind. But it's never forget that blessing always follows obedience. There's something that happens when we step out in faith and say, I'm, I don't know if this is from God or it's me, but this is what I see. And you'll bless, you'll totally bless the person on the hot seat. Um, number three, we follow the flow of the Spirit. The F is flow there. First Thessalonians says, don't stifle the Holy Spirit. Um, 1 Corinthians says, all who prophesy take a turn to speak one after another so that uh, everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember, the people who prophesy are in control of the Spirit and they can take turns. Um, I was in a church not long ago and um, somebody who had come to that church and prophesied before, had come back. He wasn't really associated with the church, and last time he said some really nasty things to the church. So I wanted to know what he wanted to say, and he didn't want to tell me. 
And I quoted him this verse, the spirit, the, 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 the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. You can tell me what you're going to say. And he wouldn't do that. So I told the elders that if someone's not going to tell me what they would say, if I was the pastor, I would not let him stay here. So that's what he told that guy, and that's, he left. Anyway, um, you are, you've got control over the prophecy. So everything is, every, you, you've got control over the gifts. You, you start them, you stop them, you're in control of them. And so you do things in an orderly way. That was Paul's point in Corinthians. Uh, you read the book of Corinthians, and that church was out of control. You know, they would start eating and getting drunk on the communion before other people came and showed up. You know, everyone was speaking in tongues all the time. The women sat over there and would ask their husbands over here, what is he saying over the crowd? And it was chaotic. And Paul is trying to straighten all that out here. So he says, the spirit of the prophet, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So do things, uh, follow the flow of the spirit when you prophesy. Number four, we start with what he gives us. That's the G. God leads you along. When we have, we're going to have the hot seat up here momentarily. I've got a volunteer. <laughs> he was so brave without even knowing what he's getting into. I'm just so proud of him. Um, and uh, when he's up here, some people, some of you, you've prophesied your whole life. And you're going to come up and give him something really good right out of the gate. Others of you have never done it before, and you're terrified to do anything. But by faith, you're going to stand up, and you're going to come, and you're going to share that little bit that God gives you. It might be a Bible verse. It might be a color. It might be a poem. It might be anything that God gives you. But that's work with what he gives you. Don't worry if the first person stands up and goes on and on and on and on and on, and you just have one word. Use that one word. Start with what he gives you. He'll give you more as you're obedient with what he gives you. And, and honestly, if the, I meet more people who are afraid of, to say something because they don't know what it means. I want to liberate you from this today. Almost every time in scripture, the prophet was never told to explain the meaning of the prophecy. Almost every time. I think there's one where Jeremiah says, no, you idiots, it is for you. But everyone else, it just, it, they're just there. And, and we've been in places when someone prophesies and then stops and says, no, this is for you. And we'd say, okay, time out. You can't do that. It's not the prophet's job to interpret what they prophesy. So that liberates you if you're just starting out. Because you don't need to know what it means. You just have to give it in faith and in love. And uh, it's Holy Spirit who teaches us all things anyway. So the person in the hot seat that you're practicing on today will receive whatever Holy Spirit tells them to, that it means. Okay? Number five, how we pro we're gentle to all. That's the G there. We're gentle to all. When you're ministering to the person... Um, Unless you speak in King James Version all the time, don't speak in King James Version when you're prophesying. Really, what the goal is today, we want to practice it. But the practical part of it today is you do this over coffee. And you start encouraging people prophetically over coffee. You do this when you're waiting for your kids at the school. You do this in your workplace when, when somebody comes in and they're angry at you because you didn't do their job right. And, and, and you can use the prophetic right then and speak life and speak hope and speak truth. You got to be gentle when you do it. You got to be gentle. Paul told Timothy, and the ser Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. Number six, we look for the gold. I just saw that countdown timer. That's not 13 minutes, it's 13 hours. It gave me 13 hours to speak. All right. <laughs> I think I set that up wrong. Um, <laughs> We 
We look for the gold. That's the G. You look for the gold. Uh, a prophecy can come from one of three sources. It can come from Holy Spirit. That's the H if you're taking notes. Holy Spirit, that's a good thing. That's what we want to go for all the time. That's the number one thing you're going to hear today. It's from Holy Spirit himself. Number two, it can come from human spirit. That's the next H. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. And third, it can come from a demonic spirit. And that's 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. That is uh, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So demonic inspired prophecy is subtle, deceptive, manipulative, and domineering. You need the gift of discerning spirits to know when you're being influenced by those thoughts. You can be influenced by someone near you, so be aware, don't be afraid, and don't forget to speak in love and honor people. Um, I used to make the mistake of inviting strangers over to our house without knowing why they wanted to come, or going for coffee with strangers without knowing why they wanted to meet. I've learned to ask why, um, and this is one of the reasons why. <laughs> this couple came to our house, and I don't know how I got connected with them, but they wanted to meet us, and okay, come on over, and we're having coffee, and um, they said God told them I was going to open the door for them for ministry. And I didn't know them, but I was more prepared to do deliverance ministry right there on them than open the door for ministry for them. They weren't open to getting set free, and so we said goodbye and kicked them out of the house. Just because God says, God told me, it ain't so. <laughs> we need to know here. And to know here means we need to be in here. And we need to be around people that we can trust to give us discernment. And we need the Holy Spirit to be in contact with the Holy Spirit so he can tell us, yeah, no, don't go there. No, no, no. Prophecy inspired by the human spirit is often negative and critical. You can be tempted to speak out these words when you see the garbage in people's lives. Um, two stories here. We had, um, I spoke at a business, Christian business uh, meeting one day. And afterwards, we had a good prayer time and people were prophesying over us and it was, it was just, it was good. And then the pastor who people whose people were there prophesying over us started to hear some of those prophecies and started to kind of get upset because a lot of his people were there. And it, I could tell the more they seemed to like me, the more he thought they liked him less. And so he prophesied over me that you're not to be here. You got to leave. You got to go somewhere else. God's calling you to go somewhere else. And again, seriously, I, didn't, I wasn't hearing that from God. <laughs> but I was seeing in him, that was, he was totally speaking out of his fear, not of faith. Um, we also had this time when we, there was a group of us from a church that we were attending the church, and the pastor asked us to pray for this couple that... Yeah, like in front of everybody. So we're all going to pray, but Trevor and Karen are going to lead the prayer. Fine. Except I saw the word divorce on their foreheads. And I didn't want to out them in front of their family and friends. Like, I didn't want, I didn't, like, what do you do with that? So I didn't pray against any divorce, but I prayed that love would increase. And I prayed that forgiveness would come and I prayed that grace would be given sometimes you see the junk people go through but that you just you got to ask God okay what's the gold there what how do, how can I minister in that 
Because honestly, it would have been devastating if I started out, you shall not be divorced. Um, prophecy from the heart of God will always strengthen, it will always encourage, and it will always comfort. When you are sensing Holy Spirit, or you're just sensing the need to speak God's word in a situation, start asking God, what, give me the words that bring life. And Lord, let me see the treasure that you see in him or her. One tool that, that we've learned in this uh, Listening to God series is, is just imagine Jesus is standing next to them and look at, to see what Jesus is doing. What is Jesus saying to them? And then you just copy what Jesus is doing. And, and if you train your, your imagination to see Jesus in the situation, it's a great tool for you to use. Number seven, how do we prophesy? We receive impartation. Scripture tells us we get impartation from the Father and also from others. That is the F and that is the O if you're taking notes. I have only have 13 hours and 9 minutes to get to all those things, so we're not going to look them up at that time. Um, you know, prophecy is powerful. And I think probably the only thing that I know of at this time in my journey that's more powerful than prophecy is the ability for someone to hear God for themselves. And what we're about to do next is going to help you to hear God for yourself. And it's going to help you learn how to prophesy over someone words of life and encouragement and strengthening. But it's also going to, it will teach you, like, if, if there's anything I can, like, I want you to know that you can trust God, love God, and hear from God, and obey God, and, and then I, you're set for life. You're set for anything that's going to come. What we're going to do is the hot seat. Before we do that, we're going to have a prayer of impartation. So I'm going to have all of you stand up. And I'm going to assume you are all eagerly desiring. I'm going to assume you all want to speak words of life and words of hope and words of truth. And if you don't, you've got to repent and do that because that's what God's created you for. I didn't get to that part, but really, that's what it is. So uh, I'm going to pray a prayer of impartation. So Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are the giver of gifts. And Father, we are asking for the gift of prophecy, for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of others. I pray, Lord God, that as Jesus was only saying the words he heard you say, we would come closer to only saying the words we hear you say. And Lord, I pray that those who have never prophesied yet would open themselves up to this experience. And Lord God, they would take that step of faith and they would risk and they would see with boldness, Lord God, what, what you have for them. And so, Lord God, everyone who wants to receive, say amen. 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 Okay, you can be seated. Now, I need a chair up here. Matt, could you help me get a chair right up here facing that way? And I'm going to invite Curtis up here to be our hot seat contestant. Thank you. Perfect. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to, Curtis is going to come up here. We're going to stop broadcasting at this point. Can we stop the broadcast now? I'm assuming we're broadcasting and we're going to stop the broadcast. Reason being is we are practicing prophecy now. And I don't want any excuse for you to say, oh, I, I don't want to say it because it's going to be on the line and I, I don't, what if I get it wrong? So we're not going to have that, okay? We are going to record it. And so I'm going to have you come up and speak into the mic and it's going to be recorded. That recording is for Curtis. 
Because maybe next week, maybe next year, maybe 10 years from now, he'll want to hear what you speak over his life and just, and just see how God has worked it out in his life. So we want it recorded. We're not going to broadcast. And I forgot to make this clear to the people upstairs today.